So tonight's topic is blood on the throne. We're going to be looking tonight at Revelation. It's going to base our study off Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 is going to be the basis of our study tonight, Blood on the Throne. Now, we're going to be meeting here every night for this whole week. We have some exciting topics that we are going to be studying and a few topics that we're going to be looking at. Tomorrow evening at 6.30 is Revelation's Mother of All Battles. So what is the battle going to be over anyway? Last night, if you were here, our topic was on the eve of Armageddon. And we really did not uh, define Armageddon, yet we did look at the signs that lead us to the Battle of Armageddon. And we're getting close to that time. And what we studied last night, if you were with us, is we looked at the time of the end, right, and the end of time. Now, are these the same time period, or are they two different time periods? They're different, right? One precedes the latter. So the time of the end is a time that initiates a series of signs around the world that are to wake the church up to the reality that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is just about to come again. Jesus never reveals the future unless he reveals the signs leading up to his coming. We can be ready. And so the time of the end precedes the end of time. The end of time is coming very, very soon. So we're going to be looking at Revelation's mother of all battles. We're going to look at the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet of Revelation 16 as these three characters fight against God and his government, leading to this final climactic battle. What is it about? We're going to find out tomorrow night. And then Thursday evening, our topic is the Ancient of Days and the Time of of the end. Now, you know that already, the time of the end. We talked about that last night. But Thursday night, we're going to really zero in. We're going to zero in on the time of the end. What does it really mean? What event has taken place in the prophetic clock of prophecy where God says, this is it. Get ready. We're going to look at the Bible's longest time prophecy in the Bible. It's going to be amazing. And if you have any doubt, and it's okay if you do, that's why you're here, and we're glad that you're here. If you have any doubt as to the validity of the Bible, I guarantee you, and I'm, you can hold me to this, I guarantee you that you will not doubt this book after Thursday evening. I want you to hold me to that because I want you to be here, 630, the Ancient of Days and the Time of the End. And then Friday night, 630, our topic is a thief in the night. You know, the good news is Jesus is coming again. Amen? Isn't that good news? Every time we talk and pray and sing about it, it should be sweeter every time. I believe that. A thief in the night. How will he come? What did Jesus say about that? And many other prophets in Scripture, what did they say this is going to be a climactic message, one that's really controversial if you think about it. There are novels written, movies made on how Christ will come or how he will not come. And we're going to just put these publications and these uh, media projects aside. And we're going to go to the only source I believe is the foundation of the Christian church, the Bible. Amen? And we're going to find out what did Jesus say, most importantly. What does the Bible say about a thief in the night. And then Saturday morning, you heard me right. Saturday what? Morning, right here at 11 o'clock in the morning, all right? Now, I know that's the day that you sleep in, but you got to be here at 11 o'clock in the morning because our topic is the Antichrist what? No guessing, no speculating. You're not going to get my personal opinion. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what does Revelation say. And we will, without question, identify the Antichrist of Bible prophecy Saturday morning at 11 o'clock right here. So mark your calendar and make sure that you're here. You do not want to miss this one. You do not want to miss who the Antichrist is. That's at 1130. 
And then Saturday at what time? 3 p.m. So we have one at 11.30, or 11, I, sh I should say. One at 3 p.m., and our topic at 3 p.m. is when the world worships the beast. Listen, you're going to be shocked. You're gonna, this is going to be a shocking revelation. How is all the world going to wander after this beast? What's going to happen? We're going to find out at 3 o'clock, and you will, you will appreciate what the Bible says about this, when the world worships the beast. And then our final message will be Saturday evening. So we have three topics Saturday. But that will conclude the series. It's going to be uh, three in a row. It's going to be very intense, but nonetheless, it's going to be worth it. Because when we come back Saturday evening at 6.30 for our final presentation, it's going to be crown him or crucify him. The saddest story ever told. We're going to find out how this actually impacts us today. It's going to be a prophetic message. Don't let the title fool you, all right? You'll see when we study this Saturday evening. You know, I've been told that I speak too slow. I'm joking. I get a little excited about the Bible, amen? And there's sometimes, well, not sometimes, probably all the time, I get a little fast whenever I try to deliver a message. So my goal tonight is to slow it down a little bit so that you can write down some of those verses because we will be going through a lot of Scripture tonight, okay? You'll see why when we study blood on the throne. All right. Are you ready for tonight? Are you ready for tonight? All right. What must we do before we open the Bible? Never should we open the Bible without prayer. So I appreciate your prayers. Pray for me. I need God's Spirit. I'll be praying for you. And let's bow our heads, shall we? Loving Father in heaven, again, it's a privilege to be here um, in the city of Miles. Thank you for such eager people that are wanting to learn more about Jesus Christ. And I pray for your Spirit to be with us here in this auditorium. This is the most climactic and important topic that we could be covering in the series, and we want to know more about Jesus, so lead us by your Spirit. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was the final seconds of the championship game. The home team was down by about four points. It was the final play. The home team had the ball, and the quarterback called the play. They lined up on the line of scrimmage. He snapped the ball. He was running as the defenders were chasing him to take him out of bounds, and as he was looking for his favorite wide receiver, couldn't find him anywhere. He thought the game was about over. And then at the corner of his eye, he saw his receiver running down the sideline as fast as he could go. And he dropped back with his strong arm and just lobbed that ball in the air. And then the hometown crowd, they all went to their feet. And they knew this was it. Either he catches it or they will lose the game. And there was nothing but silence as they watched that ball bobble in the air. And then the receiver, as he ran into the end zone, he dove with all of his strength and speed, grabbed that ball at the tip of his fingers, brought it in, and boom, touchdown. You should have heard that hometown crowd that evening. But it's nothing compared, nothing compared to what we're going to witness in God's everlasting kingdom. Let's go to Revelation now, chapter 19, to begin our study tonight. Notice what John sees in the end of time. In heaven... Revelation chapter 19, and here we'll read beginning now in verse 1. It says, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say only a very few will get into God's kingdom. On the contrary, there will be many people. In fact, the Bible says a great number which no man could number. Hear much people in heaven saying, Alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Drop down to verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God and sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, verse 7, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So here is 
projection of the future. It's a prophecy around the throne of God. The Father is there. The Lamb of God is there. All the living creatures are there, the 24 elders. And all the saints clothed in white robes representing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They're gathered around the throne, and there's a celebration. They're singing praise and honor and glory unto God because of what he has done for them. Now, we're going to find this gathering that God reveals over and over again throughout this prophetic book. Let's go now to the book of Revelation chapter 7, and let's look at another um, instance of this. Chapter 7, Revelation, beginning in verse 9. Revelation 7, what verse? Verse 9, that's right. After this, John says, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And verse 11 talks about how they gather around the throne and they worship before Him. Once again, a multitude, the Bible says, which no man could number, they're gathered around the throne of God, giving praise and honor and glory to the one who has given them redemption. Now tonight, we're going to base our study. We're going to go now to Revelation chapter 4. If you have your Bible, let's go there now. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Here is another prophecy of a gathering, a convocation around the throne of God. This was a little bit more unique, as we'll see, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 4 and verse 1. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. Where was that door open? It says, In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, verse 2, he says, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And so I'm going to submit to you tonight that the one on the throne is the Ancient of Days. It is God the Father. If you read verse 4, we won't tonight, but if you want to read verse 4, the Bible says the 24 elders are gathered around the throne of God. You can read on verse 5 and verse 6. It says there, the living creatures are there around the throne, the seraphims and the cherubims. All the orders of the heavenly angelic host are around the throne. Something very important is about to take place. Now drop down to chapter 5 now because they kind of go together. And let's look now at verse 1. Revelation 5 and verse 1. And notice the God the Father on the throne. He has something in his hand. And John begins to zero and begins to focus on the Father. And here's what he says. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now, have you heard of the seven seals of Revelation? Have you? The seven seals are right here introduced. And in chapter 6, we find each seal breaking leading up to a time where there's going to be silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That's the final, the seventh seal, if you will. But as we come down to Revelation chapter 5, what we're going to look at tonight is what is the book? Because before we get to the seals, we're going to look at what is actually in that book that is so vital, so important, that has an impact upon the salvation of the world. So he's looking at the book, and John says in verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man, verse 3, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And so the book that has in the hand of God the Father, this book is the title deed to this present world. Unless someone can take the book from the Father's hand and claim the right to this place as their own, the world is eternally lost. The Bible says no man in heaven, no man on earth, no man under the earth, those that have passed away, that are buried, that are sleeping, they have no right. They, have, they cannot take the scroll from the Father's hand. And John begins to realize the implications, the ramifications. If nobody can take the book from the Father's hand, John realizes he's lost everybody else in this world is eternally lost. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But I have good news for you. Look at verse 4. He says, And I wept much, and I wept much, because 
man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. John recognizes, unless the book can be claimed, the world is lost. And then verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. That's past tense, isn't it? Something already took place. He hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So John is weeping, and he picked up by the elder, and the elder says, Don't weep, John. And he hears who is worthy. The lamb, we read in verse 5 and 6, the root of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Verse 6, And I beheld, and he says, And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Can you say amen? And so Jesus walks into this heavenly tribunal, and the elder picks John up. He says, John, don't weep. Somebody's worthy. Jesus comes bearing the scars. If you can notice, he's a lamb as it had been slain. So notice he walks into heaven. He ascends from the earth to his father's place. He walks. The angels want to worship him. He waves them back. And he walks to his father to receive his father's recognition that his sacrifice was complete. Jesus walks to his father. His father puts his arms around him. And his father says, let all the angels of heaven worship him, for he is worthy. Jesus takes the scroll from the father's hand. He now owns the title deed to the world. Jesus said himself, I have all power in and where and on earth. Go ye therefore into all the world. Let me tell you something. The devil claims this world is his stake, but no longer can he do it. It belongs to Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 5, in verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now, the seven spirits of God, the Bible says the Father gives to Jesus, and he has seven eyes, he has seven horns. Now, eyes represent wisdom in Scripture, right? It's not that he has seven literal eyes, but seven is the number of plenitude, the number of completeness. He has all wisdom. Horns in, in Scripture represent power. Does Jesus have all power? Yes, he does. And he also has the seven spirits of God, and he sends those seven spirits into all the earth. So as Jesus is stepping up to be inaugurated as our mediator, as our heavenly high priest, the Father gives him something. He doesn't keep it for himself, but he gives it to the church on the earth on the day of Pentecost. What was that? Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 11. Notice Isaiah chapter 11, and here the prophet, the gospel prophet of the Old Testament, tells us exactly what those seven spirits represent. It doesn't represent seven literal different spirits, and yet, but yet the Bible says it's the plenitude or the fullness of the Spirit. Notice verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And notice verse 2. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It says, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Number one. And the Spirit of wisdom. Number two. And understanding. Three. It says, and the Spirit of counsel. Number four. And might. Five. The Spirit of knowledge. Number six. And of the fear of the Lord, number seven, what we have in verse two is a revelation of the fruit of the Spirit as Jesus gives it to the church. And the Bible says he sends into the earth the seven spirits of God. So why do we find a lamb mangled, bleeding, walking into heaven? What has he done? Did he get caught in some type of crossfire? What happened to the lamb? What happened to Jesus whereby now he gains the world back into himself? It was his by creation in the beginning. But the Bible says we are carnal, sold under sin. We forfeited, right, dominion. And now Jesus has to purchase the world by his blood to bring the world back into his own possession. Now let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to the beginning. Look at Genesis chapter 1. God gave Adam and Eve dominion from the very beginning. 
Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our what? Image, after our likeness. And let them, the Bible says, have dominion. So God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the world. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. They were not to exploit the earth, but they were given to preserve the earth. But that dominion was forfeited. They lost dominion. They chose to believe a lie, thus submitting themselves under the influence of another power. The devil now claims to be the prince of of this world. Why? Because he succeeded in bringing sin into the human family. Now, I want you to notice what the devil says to Jesus in the wilderness of temptation. Come with me now to the book of Luke chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, we're going to look at Luke now, chapter 4, and beginning now in verse 5. Luke chapter 4 and verse 5. Jesus was just baptized. He was anointed for his ministry. He began with the fast in the wilderness, and the devil wanted to exploit him. He wanted to attack him at his weakest time. So he began to present all these temptations to Christ. Verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of, a, in the, of the world in a moment of time. So must have been some Hollywood production. Think about it. I mean, imagine if you were there watching Satan presenting the glory of the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. You know, today we see some exciting CGI, right? Computer-generated imagery. But I can just imagine what that must have looked like to the eye of Christ. And so he presented this beautiful picture. Listen, here's the kingdoms of the world. And then he goes on to say here in verse 6, it says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, he says, I will what? I will give it. So he claims dominion, and he offered it to Christ. If you worship me, I will give you dominion. But the Bible tells us that Jesus defeated him on his own ground. Amen? And he gained the victory. Now, you're ready for Revelation. Let's go to the book of Revelation now, chapter 12. We're not going to look at this chapter in depth tonight, but I'm going to share something with you that is profound. It's going to be something that is a revelation of Jesus Christ. As we've learned, Revelation is a book that testifies of him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Look at Revelation chapter 12. We have a woman brought to view. It's a symbolic woman. She's about to give birth to a seed. The dragon is there to devour the seed as soon as the seed is born among men. And the Bible says that this seed walks on the earth, but he's taken up to the very throne of heaven. It's basically a prophetic revelation of the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. But in Revelation chapter 12, notice what it says about his death, beginning now in verse 9 and verse 10. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, right? So we know that he was cast out of heaven long before Adam and Eve sinned. But notice the casting out referred to here is casting out when Jesus dies on the cross. He says it is what? Finished. And the devil knew he could no longer claim his stake because it was bought by the precious blood of the Lamb. Jesus has all power. Now look at verse 10 of Revelation chapter 12. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Where now? In heaven. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So the Bible says rejoicing in heaven. Why? Because Jesus has brought salvation to the world. He's cast the devil out. Now, I want you to notice verse 12 of Revelation chapter 12. Notice how this kind of affects heaven. How does heaven view salvation and the fact that Jesus gave his life for the redemption of man? Verse 12, 
Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a what? A short time. You see, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, it set in motion the prophetic clock that caused the devil to realize his days are now numbered. He can no longer claim the world. And now what does he do? He cannot attack Jesus directly. So now he focuses his wrath upon the little infant church, right? He's coming down having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. So last night when we study the signs of the times of Matthew 24, it's Christ simply predicting the wrath of the dragon to take down as many people as he can before Jesus comes the second time. Are we witnessing the signs that are being intense today? Are we seeing more frequency and more intensity? Indeed. It is a revelation of the Bible that the devil is working over time. Let's go to the book of John chapter 12. Look at John chapter 12, the gospel of John chapter 12, and let's look at verse... Notice verse 32. John 12 and what verse? Verse 32. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So he's referring to his death. Now look at verse 31. This will put it in perspective. Verse 31. Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Don't miss this. Now shall the prince of this world be what? Cast out. You see that? When he died, he said, it is finished. It was the figurative death knell to the head of the serpent. He knew that his life would be taken in the end, and so now he comes with great wrath. In the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin causes so much more than what we realize. Not only is the wages of sin death, but once they chose to believe a lie and not believe a thus saith the Lord. God told them of all the trees you can eat of, but the tree in the midst of the garden, God said, do not eat it. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely what? You shall surely die. Sin brings shame. It brings guilt. Separation, if you will. God comes in the cool of the day. He says, Adam, where art thou? He couldn't even find him. He was fellowshipping with Adam every single day. God knew exactly where Adam was. But spiritually speaking, Adam was far from God, wasn't he? And when he found Adam, he says, Adam, why are you afraid of me? Why have you fled from me? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? And you know what Adam did? Notice what sin does to us. Adam said, you know, the woman that you made gave me the fruit. Ladies, what was he doing? Was he passing the buck? Right? He was blaming Eve for his own choice. And God turned. Eve, he says, did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat of? And so she says, it was the serpent that you made that gave it to me. So ultimately, who are they blaming for their sin? They were blaming God. Do people do the same thing today? You know, there is repercussions. There's cause and effect. Sin brings pain. Sin brings suffering. Sin brings death and misery, right? And people often blame God for the choices of humanity. But the good news is God has provided a way out, hasn't he? He has provided a way out. Now, in the Old Testament, God gave a series of scale model representations of how God deals with sin. They had to bring a lamb with them. Imagine if you had to bring a lamb to church with you every weekend. That would get expensive, wouldn't it? And they would have to place their hands on the head of the animal with all their weight. And they would confess their sin on the innocent animal. It had to be without blemish. And as they would confess their sins figuratively, the sin of the person would transfer to the innocent animal. They would take a knife, plunge the knife into the neck of the innocent animal. As the blood would flow, the animal would look up, wondering, why is it dying? And the animal would die. The person would leave with a clean slate, forgiven of their sin. 
The wages of sin is what? It is death. The Lamb of God had to pay the price for us to have a place in his eternal kingdom. Now, we read in Revelation 19 tonight that the fine linen in that heavenly gathering is the righteousness of the saints. But yet the Bible says, as it is written, there is none, there is how many? None righteous, no, not one. So how did they get it? How does this group without number, this great multitude, attain righteousness? The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned. How many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet we know in Romans 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the good news is this, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift from God, we're told in the Bible. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what we're going to look at are three successive steps to getting to the throne of God. Blood on the throne, Jesus is there, the scars are still on his hand and his feet, and on his side and on his holy brow. He intercedes on our behalf. He ever liveth to make intercession. So how can we be among that number that we read about over and over again that sing glory and praise and honor unto God and unto the Lamb? The first thing that we need to understand that many do not understand, you'd be surprised how many professed Christians have no idea of this gospel truth. Listen carefully. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We have no natural desire to want to follow God in Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Our, we've all been bitten by the serpent. Our natures have been perverted. We are selfish. We are self-centered. The Bible says the way of man is not in himself to direct his path, to direct his steps. Can the leper change his spots? The Bible says, how can you, who are accustomed to do evil, do good? It is not natural for us to come after God, to want him. If we have any desire to want to follow after Jesus, that is divine evidence that there is a power outside of your heart that's drawing you to him. What did Jesus say in John 6, 44? No man can come to me except the Father which has seen me do what? Draw him. It's a gift. It's the power of God's Spirit. And the Bible says God lightens every man that comes into the world. So we cannot of ourselves come to God. If you have a desire, and I believe that you do, you can know that it's God knocking at the door of your heart. That day will one day close. That opportunity will not be there one day, but it is today. Now, the first step is this. We need to understand what true repentance is. The Bible says we need a godly repentance. Repentance, basically and essentially, is not just recognizing sin. For the devil can recognize what sin is. He knows it's wrong. But the Bible says a sorrow for sin. The Bible says I will be sorry, a godly sorrow. Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 38. Let's look at verse 18. We're going to look at a series of verses here. We're going to find out tonight how we can all be around that throne. And this is really the most important thing. Psalm 38, before we get into the more prophetic messages, this is imperative. It is foundational. Psalm 38 in verse 18, we read, for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be what? Sorry for my sin. That's what David says, his son Solomon. Let's go now to the book of Proverbs, chapter 28. Proverbs 28 in verse 13. Notice what the wise man Solomon has to say. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So it's not enough just to say, you know, Lord, I'm sorry. I recognize it's wrong. We have to turn away from it. And only true godly repentance can allow us and enable us to turn away from the power of sin. But notice what we just read in this verse. As we respond to that drawing power of God, as we recognize that our sins cause the pain in the heart of Jesus Christ, we come to a point that we recognize our choices, our sins, need to be confessed, right? 1 John 1, 9, if we do what? 
confess our sins, He is faithful, not you, not me. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God says, listen, we must be willing to confess. Now, does God need you and me to confess in order to understand what we've done? Or does He know all things? Doesn't the eyes of the Lord run to and fro on the earth? Doesn't He take everything in? The Bible says uh, in the book of Hebrews, all things are open and naked to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. He knows everything. So why does the Bible say confession is so imperative? Let me tell you why. Because confession is really for you and me. I have two children. And when they were younger, my son is 10 years old, whenever he would disobey, I would want him to tell me what he did. I wanted him to confess. Why? Because I want him to understand the impact it has upon those in his life. It hurts me. It hurts those around him. And the choices we make hurts the heart of God. It hurts our loved ones. And when we recognize the cause and effect, the repercussions, we recognize that sin is awful. And we want to confess that sin. But once we confess, who is faithful and just? Who is? God is. You're not saved by your emotions. You're not saved by how you feel. You believe what God says. If we confess, God says, I am faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 3. Quickly, look at Romans chapter 3. And what a powerful chapter this is. Look at Romans chapter 3. By the way, once you confess, you are now in Christ. The Father looks at you. He does not see your past. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your filthiness, your iniquity, all your mistakes. All he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, for you now are hid with Christ in God. Isn't that beautiful? It is your ticket to heaven. You've done no good. You have no righteousness of your own. It's a gift. He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. This is your ticket to heaven. Look at chapter 3 of Romans. It doesn't end there. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 the Bible says being justified. That word justified simply means you're forgiven. You're made right with God. It's a theological word. Don't let it discourage you. Being justified, what's the next word? Freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, which simply means a substitute in your place, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, and then verse 26, he's so excited, notice he repeats himself, and this is what he emphasizes. Don't miss this. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. Notice this. Not only does he accredit to your account the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but the life that he lived... That unadulterated life, that pure holy life that Jesus lived, he takes that life and gives you that righteousness as though you lived that life. Who would argue with a transaction like that? Giving him your filthiness, right, in exchange for his righteousness, his holy life. You stand justified. This is your ticket to heaven. You know what I believe the hardest thing is for people? It's not to obey God. I think that's easy. If you love somebody, you're going to obey them. You're going to serve them, right? It's a joy. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. I believe the hardest thing for people to grasp and to believe is how much God truly loves them. I believe it's the hardest thing for a person to accept is the value that God places upon them. Often we want to do something in exchange. We want to give something. It makes us feel better in our own selfishness. But the Bible says there's nothing you can add. There's nothing you can give. It is a gift from heaven. You must believe how much God truly loves you. Imagine if you go to the bank and you work hard every single day to pay the mortgage on your home, your property, and you know that most of that money goes to interest, right? Very little goes to the principal to pay it off. Let's say you go to the teller and you go to make that payment. You worked hard during the month and the teller takes that money and puts it back in your hand. She says, your account is clear. You owe not a dime. Are you going to argue with her? I know I'm not. I'm going to be excited, aren't you? Jesus paid a price, a heavy price for our redemption. But many people don't feel forgiven. 
Many people base their faith and their Christian experience off how they feel for that day. But like I said before, you're not saved by your feelings. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by what? By faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? By the word of God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the feelings will come after we manifest faith in God's word. And so people wake up, they don't feel good one day, and they feel like that God doesn't love them anymore. And that's how they live their lives. God is not subject to your circumstances. God's love is not subject to how you feel. Jesus said, you are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. You know, I remember in Matthew chapter 8, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Remember the Roman centurion sent a messenger to Jesus. He was preaching to the, to, uh, the Israelites, his own people. And the messenger came and said, hey, I have a master who has a servant that's sick. He loves him very much. He's a Gentile, and the Gentiles were hated, weren't they, back in the days of Christ. And so as everyone is listening, he asked him, will you come to his house and heal his servant? Jesus stood up. He said, I'm coming. I'm on my way. And as he began to walk towards the Roman centurion's home, the messenger runs back to his master, tells him, he's on his way to your house. And the centurion met him halfway, and he said, listen, he says, stop where you are. He says, I'm a man under authority. I have men under me. And when I tell them to do something, I know that they will do it. But he says, you are different. He says, you're different. All you have to do is speak the word only. And whatever you say, it will happen. Amen? All you have to do is say it. And my servant shall be healed. Jesus turned around because his own people were following him. And you know what he said? I have not found so great a faith, not even among Israel. If you want the brass definition of what faith is, you have it right there from the lips of the master himself. Jesus said, if you believe what he says, all you have to do is believe the word of God. God said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me what? Void. It will accomplish that what I say. Now, once you're in Christ, that's your ticket to heaven. Praise God. Now, Christ wants to live his life where? In you. This is called sanctification. The next step. This is your fitness for heaven. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. And so we need sanctification. Christ wants to live his life in you. So the steps of forgiveness is that they acknowledge their guilt, they confess their sin, they accept forgiveness, they believe God's promise. Therefore, any man be in whom? Christ. He is a new what? Creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things, not some, not most, but how many? All things become new. Listen, friends, you believe it. This is what the Bible says. And God declares it through the power of his word. Let's go now to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In fact, let's go to Romans rather. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. I want to look at one verse with you. Romans chapter 5, and let's look at verse 10. Romans 5, and what verse? Verse 10. The Bible says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. So that's justification. He died on the cross. He gave you your ticket to heaven. You're in Christ. You've done no good. You accept the gift, the promise. You're on your way. But then he says, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? By his life. Tell me something. Does Jesus live today? Does the Bible say he ever liveth to make intercession for us? He's not in heaven on the cloud, twisting his thumbs, waiting for the prophetic clock to go off 
to come take us to be with him. He's engaged. He's active on your behalf. He wants to be the power as the Spirit channels the power from God's throne to empower your life. He wants to live his life in you. In fact, look now at Ephesians now, chapter 1, and notice the power that God grants us. Ephesians chapter 1, that Christ wants to give every single one of us. Look now at verse 17. It says in Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Notice something. The very same divine power that we witness through the reading of the Bible that resurrected Jesus Christ. When the angel came from heaven and says, Thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. And Jesus came out of the grave and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. That power that brought him to life is the same power, if we believe, that God will grant to us. Mercy, I thought I'd hear at least one amen. Amen? Isn't that powerful? The very same power. Look at chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And beginning now in verse... Um, Look at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And then verse 16. We have a lot of students in here tonight, don't we? I know we have students here. Medical students, college students. Look at verse 16. That he would grant you. You like that word grant, don't you? You like that. What does that mean, that he's going to grant you? You don't have to pay it back. You don't have to give anything for it. He's going to give you something. He's going to grant you. Look at this according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? Faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Have mercy. Now, when Jesus walked the earth, can we honestly say that he was filled with the fullness of God? Of course he was, right? Now, we just read. I didn't say it. It's what we read. That we also can be filled with all the fullness of God. You know what the devil says today? He says, pie in the sky. Oh, it sounds good. It's okay if you read it and you think that maybe it might be true, you know, but you can never attain it. That's what he says. And many of you here tonight may be thinking, well, Jason, listen, how do I tap into that power? It sounds good. You know, you hear preachers talk about it. You know, we hear sermons about it, songs that are being sung about the power of God into salvation. But how do we plug in? How do we really get the power that we read about right here? Let's go to the book of 2 Peter chapter uh, 1. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Towards the back of your Bible, how do we gain the power? 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 2. It says here in verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then in verse 3 it says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as His divine power. What type of power again? We're reading about divine power right here. Hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these, by the promises of God, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." So how do we gain the power? Through the what? Through the promises of God. Hey, when God says something, does he mean it? If God says, I'm going to give you power, you don't have to yield to this temptation. You can have strength to overcome this over here. Do you believe it? Jesus says, according to your faith, so be it unto you. Your power, listen, is limitless. When you put your will 
on the side of God's will, your will becomes omnipotent. It does. That's your privilege. The Bible says we are seated with Him in heavenly places. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? As it is in heaven. You know what the devil does? His greatest strength, and I want to share this before I share that. You have to cooperate with God. Knowledge will not save us. We can memorize Genesis through Revelation and have all knowledge and all wisdom. But unless we have love for God, a, an experimental knowledge of His Word, a belief in the promises, and applying the power in our lives, growing in grace, right? Sanctified, Christ living His life in you, we must be willing to submit to God. He's not going to coerce you. Coerce you. We are all created free moral agents. True love does not compel. True love gives. Isn't that right? Love does not take the benefit of the doubt. Love gives to the other person. And love does not run the risk of hurting the object of the affections. And if we truly love God, we're not going to try to find a way around it. We'll do it. Why? Because we love Him because He first what? He first loved us. Let's go to the book of James chapter 4 and verse 7. Look at James chapter 4 in your Bibles tonight and verse 7. James 4, what verse? Yes, thank you very much. Verse 7. And notice what is the first word in that verse? What does it say? It says submit. So God is giving you an opportunity. He won't force it. He says submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he might flee from you. It says he what? He will. He has no choice. A friend of mine, I'm related to him now, but uh, he was very instrumental in training me for the ministry, and he told me a story about um, some Clydesdale horses. You know what Clydesdales are? They're massive horses, right? They have a lot of uh, hair on, the, on their hooves and, and their tails, and uh, they were in Canada, northern Canada, and the men were dropping trees. They were lumberjacks. They were cutting trees down. But back in those days, they didn't have the equipment that they have today. So they would tie these big ropes and chains to these horses. And then they would connect it to the logs when they would drop the logs. And they would slap the back of that horse. And a massive, strong horse would just pull those, those logs out of the forest. And as the guys were kind of gathered around, you know, break time, eating their lunch, they were talking about, boy, if these horses knew how powerful they were, we'd never get any work done, right? Because the horse would do nothing. And that's how the devil is. Listen, the devil doesn't care what you know. The only thing he cares about is what you have. And if you have Jesus, he knows once you believe what he says, once you act on the promise of God and you carry out what God says, God gives you the power. He knows once you come to that point, His power is then broken. He has no power over you other than that that you give Him. Because Jesus said, now, 2,000 years ago, is the judgment of this world. Jesus said, now shall the prince of this world be what? Cast out. Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I have now all power in heaven and earth. That's what you trust in. That's how you live your life. Because the Bible says he is. Amen? And he lives today. Now, the devil's greatest successful effort is to get us to look at our past. Have you ever done that? Think about it. Every time you fall into the depth of depression, it has always been when you look in hindsight at your mistakes, your sins, your failures, things that we know we want nobody to know, it pulls us down. And every time the devil comes and reminds me and reminds you of your past and tries to keep your focus from Jesus and his promise, don't argue with him. Let me tell you why. Because he's right. We are pathetic aren't we? We are sinful. We don't deserve life. 
We deserve death. If you argue with him about how good you are, he will win the argument every time. But this is what you do. Let me suggest something. You step on his neck. You know how you do that? You tell him, you're right. I'm filthy. I'm a sinner. I deserve death. However, I believe what Jesus says. And he says he's taken my sins and thrown them into the depths of the sea. He has given me a clean life. I am hid with Christ and God. I have his righteousness. He has my sins now. Now you've got to take it up with him. Right? That's submitting to God. And the devil will flee every time. He's not going to gainsay Christ. He's not going to argue against Jesus. Right? Because he knows that Christ already what? Already won. He already defeated him. So when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future by claiming the promise of Jesus Christ through his word. Can you say amen? That's the second step, growing in grace. The Bible says be confident of this very thing. Philippians 1 verse 6, that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of the coming of Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave it to you and me to perfect ourselves. He says, I'm going to perfect you. But it's a surrender every day. It's a lifelong work every day. We learn, we grow, but we have to submit. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Now, the third and final point is glorification. You know what that means? When the Bible says this mortal shall put on immortality, is that day coming soon? You better believe it. That's right. No longer in these pathetic bodies. The Bible says our bodies will be fashioned or made like unto his glorious body, a glorified body when he comes again. In a twink of an eye at the last trump, the Bible says we shall be changed. This is glorification. Now these three steps I'm going to show you now are outlined in several verses. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice 2 Corinthians 1. They are outlined clearly through the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 9 and 10. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now look at verse 10. The Bible says, Who delivered us from so great a death. Now, when did Jesus deliver us? At the cross. At the cross. That's justification. That's your ticket to heaven, right? That's your clean slate right there, what he did for you. He delivered us. Past tense. Now, look at the next portion of the verse in the middle. And doth deliver. That's present tense, right? Does Jesus still deliver today? Does he still grant power to overcome the enemy? Indeed, that's your second step. That's sanctification. Your fitness for heaven. Look at the next one. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. That is the literal deliverance when the sky shall split and the heavens shall roll together like a scroll and Jesus shall blow the trumpet and the angels will come with him and we will be caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord and so shall we ever be with him. That is glorification. Look at Romans now chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and let's look at one more verse. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, but now being made free from sin. So when will we be made free from sin? At the cross, right? That's when he freed us. That's the first step. It goes on to say, and we become now the servants of God. So what does it mean that we are now serving God? Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We cannot obey God unless Jesus lives his life in us. This is sanctification. So we are servants. We obey the Lord. And then it says in verse 22, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, tell me something tonight, friends. What is the end? Everlasting what? Life. That's literally when Christ comes. We will literally experience everlasting life. You know, in the beginning, when sin came into the world, 
The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, that salvation was foreordained before the foundation of the world. When sin came in, God the Father and God the Son realized what had to be done if humanity would be eternally saved. Jesus knew that He would have to be the one to become sin. Now, we may not really grasp what that really means to its fullness, but let me try to describe it. Sin is just the opposite of God's holiness and purity. And His holiness and His purity knows no bound. You understand that? So you can see how awful sin is in the sight of God. And so it had to be everlasting love. It had to be divine love, compassion, mercy on a scale that is immeasurable for God to step between the world and God the Father. Jesus would say, Father, my blood is worthy. Only the Creator can redeem the creation. No angel could give his life for the sins of the world. The world is eternally lost. But the life giver can satisfy the law and yet save humanity if he's willing to step between the two parties and become sin and receive the wrath of God himself. Jesus said, my blood, my blood is worthy. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus is the Savior, and He should be the focus of our affection and our love. But often we think of the Father as an arbitrary, vindictive judge, right? He's up there with His hands folded, and, uh, you know, He says, okay, I guess we'll let Him in if you die. Not far from it. Jesus told His disciples, have you not seen Me? If you've seen Me, you've seen who? The Father, He has the same nature, the same character. He loves you just as much. He gave me to you. That's how much He wants you in heaven. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's go there. Our final verse tonight, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. In verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I want you to imagine the time when your sins and your failures plunged you into the most deepest depression that you've ever been in. When your whole life you came before your very eyes and you realize how weak, how sinful you really were. Now take everyone, and there are people that will take their lives. There are people that I have ministered to that struggled with believing God's love for them. And they ended up taking their own lives because they can't live with the guilt of the past. It's sad, but it happens all the time. Now take everyone in this auditorium. One person at one time has to bear all the guilt, all the sin, 
all the filth of everyone in this room at one time. Now take everyone in the Philippines, everything that happens in the dark recesses of this country, one person at one time has to bear all that pain, guilt, and suffering. Now take everyone in the whole world, 7 billion people, all the iniquity, all the apathy, the indifference, the abuse, murder, pain, suffering, everything, every sin. One person at one time has to bear all that sin. Now take from the beginning of earth's history to its epic conclusion, every sin that has ever been committed at one time one man has to bear all that sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Savior began to experience the weight of the sins of the whole world. We are told that his disciples watched him as they didn't even recognize him because the pressure and the pain of the weight of iniquity and darkness and sin was crushing his heart out of him, and he began to sweat great drops of blood. His body began to heave as he cried out in agony. As pure as he was, he became sin. He fell to the cold earth. He grabbed the ground as though sin was dragging him away from his father. He had never, ever been separated from his father, for he was from eternity to eternity. But for the first time, he had to bear the sins alone. He had to be by himself. And so he grabbed the cold earth as he began to sweat blood. And then the mob came and grabbed him. In that mock river trial, they condemned innocent blood to death. And as he was losing blood, heaving and breathing, he fell to the earth. They were kicking him. They were spitting upon his face. They were beating him. They took the cross, put it upon his back. It crushed his body from the weight. He had not the strength. And so they drugged his body to Golgotha's hill. And as the Creator the one who created the universe, they took the precious hands, the very tree that he himself had created, and they nailed those hands to the cross. They took the feet that were blistered, that walked the dusty paths. They nailed those feet to the tree. They lifted the tree up, thrust the tree into the ground, and Jesus began to shake with his body as the sins were crushing his life. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The sun refused to shine upon his maker. Angels veiled their faces as they watched their commander, as they watched their creator bearing the sins and dying such a horrible death. It was not the nails that killed him. For Pilate marveled that he was dead so soon. Often crucifixions took days before the victims would die. It wasn't the nails that took his life. It was our sins that crushed his heart within. They took the spear and they put the spear in his side. Two distinct streams, blood and water, came out. A ruptured heart. Back in Vietnam, they had what you called war dogs. The Vietnam War, they were invaluable. They could hear the wind blow over a tripwire. They could smell the enemy as they would lay in these dark, cold lagoons and breathe out of bamboo shoots as the soldiers would make their way. They would ambush them. So these dogs, you can imagine how valuable they were. One of them was named Paper. Hewitt was his trainer. The American boys were walking single file. They were ambushed. And uh, as the rounds were going off and the bombs were exploding, grenades were going off, Paper got hit in the back of his leg, close towards his hip. And they didn't know if he was going to survive. He was bleeding profusely. So he took Paper, put him in his arms, and he ran him to a stretcher and just drug him out of the crossfire. 
And once the battle began to subside, they, uh, they got the wounded soldiers together, the helicopter came, the Red Cross, and picked them up at a certain location. And as they're flying overhead, they get to the base where doctors and nurses are waiting for the wounded to come in. So Hewitt now is holding paper in his hands. He's nearly dead. And so as he runs in there and puts him on the table, the nurses don't know what to do. The doctor comes in and looks at him and says, well, why is he here? And so he says, you have to help him. He's going to die. He saved my life so many times. Please do something. By that time, his superior officer comes walking in, and he sees the dog, Paper, laying, just barely breathing on the table. And he says, take him out and put him out of his misery. He's going to die. And so Hewitt says, I don't mind fighting for my country and others for their freedom, but I'm not going out there without Paper. He saved my life many times. You have to do something for him. And that officer said, listen, you can work on him now, but if he doesn't walk on that back leg, he's a liability. I'll take him out myself, and I'll put a gun to his head, and I'll put him out. So the nurses began to look at his womb, try to, to clean it out and, and, and sew it back up. And so paper survived the initial night. Hewitt's there all night with him, petting him, giving him water. So People are pouring in, and they're giving their condolences, and they know what it means if he doesn't walk in that back leg. So, so paper survives the first two days. The third day comes, a week passes, and of course he's still laying there. And you know a, a dog wants to get up and run around, but he can't because he's wounded. And so people are coming and patting Hewitt on the back and saying it's going to be okay. We'll be praying for him. We hope he walks again. And two weeks go by, three weeks go by. It's time to take the bandage off. The wound is healing but it doesn't look good. And people start coming in. And Hewitt starts to cut the bandages. And he unwraps the back leg and the hip. And everyone is nothing but silence as they're just gazing and looking on to paper, hoping that he would walk. So he picks him up off the table. He puts him on the ground. And that back leg is in the air. He has it held up like this. And so he says, come on, boy. And he starts walking around, and, and paper starts hopping on three legs. And people by that time, some of them, they're crying because they know. They know how loved he is, how much he has done to save lives. They don't want him to see him dead. So they're leaving and as Hewitt's following paper around the room, hoping that maybe that back leg will start to touch the ground, it doesn't. Time goes by. It's still up in the air. And paper's just kind of hopping around, you know, don't know what to do, don't know why he can't run as fast as he wants to. And, and so Hewitt is, is petting him, and then his best friends, you know, Hewitt's friends look at him, and they can see the lips tremble. They can see the eyes begin to water. They can see Hewitt realize that he's going to see paper dead in just a few moments. So he can't hold back the tears. The tears start flowing from his cheeks, and, and they're, they're giving him a hug. They're saying, look, it's going to be okay. We're in wartime. It's just the way it is. I'm so sorry. What can I do? And so they start to leave the room, and, paper, and Hewitt is with paper. They're all alone by themselves. So Hewitt gets up, and he's he's wiping his tears, and, and as he's walking away, thinking about what the next step is, he kind of turns around and looks, and, and there's paper, and he's hopping around, but he sees that back leg touch the ground, back up again. He says, come here. Come here, boy. And he looks, he gets down on his knees, and, 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 and paper's kind of hopping, running to him, but he sees that back leg, it touches the ground, back up again. Running around, that leg touches the ground, back up again. Before you know it, he's running on all four legs. And people start pouring in. Is he using that leg? They're excited. And then you find this great gathering, this shout of victory go out in the camp. That paper is safe. He doesn't have to die. So you know he was excited. Well, time goes by, and the soldiers get their orders to go back out again. And so many of these young men, who have fought two tours of duty, are about to go home. They're talking about 
how they can't wait to get back on the chopper and then after this tour they're going to get on a 747, whatever they fly across the ocean and, and uh, Pacific Ocean back to the States and they're going to eat a nice home cooked meal from mom and dad. They can't wait to see their brothers and sisters again, right? This is their final tour and as they're walking single file, paper is the first one because they want him to hear the enemy if they're around. Hewitt's right behind him. So the soldiers, the American soldiers are kind of carrying on. They're laughing. They're talking about this, talking about that. Then paper stops. He lifts his ears up. He looks back at Hewitt, gives a trained signal, a noise, and Hewitt looks back and screams, take cover, take cover. By that time, rounds are going off. Bombs are exploding. They're being ambushed. So the soldiers are looking for whatever they can to take cover. They're, they're diving behind, you know, little hills to, to, from the bullets firing at them. They're, they're hiding behind trees, the fallen logs. So they're, they're trying to find as much cover as they can. And as the smoke is going everywhere and the rounds are going off, you can hear men screaming and crying and dying. Paper is out there by himself. And the northern Vietnamese are trying to kill him because they know how valuable these dogs are. And so Hewitt drops down to the ground. He's out there in the crossfire by himself. He puts his hands on his head, and Paper is running back trying to find Hewitt. And when the battle begins to subside, they begin to call each other's name out. Are you okay? Where are you? Are you all right? So all soldiers, not one died. These grown men came out of their cover, weeping like babies because they recognized they were seconds away from death. They were hugging each other because they were carrying on. They, were, they weren't ready. They, they thought they were safe, and they were laughing and carrying on, but it was paper that saved them. And so now they're wiping their tears because they're so they're happy that they're alive. And Hewitt told the story. He says that as I was laying on the ground, I heard the final few rounds, smoke was everywhere. And he says, I felt paper come. And what he did was he laid himself on his head and wrapped his body around the back of his head. He could feel the warmth of paper laying there protecting him from the crossfire. And he was so overwhelmed with appreciation. He says, I reached my hand back to grab him and I felt something warm. And he says, I took him off my back and I put him into my arms and paper was looking up into my eyes and he was heaving for a last breath and he saw the blood come down from his head. He had taken a shot right in the back of the head. And before he died, he wanted to be in the final moments with his master. And I'll tell you tonight that Jesus, our Savior, has taken a shot for us, hasn't he? He didn't have to come. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to bear the sins of the world. His heart did not have to rupture. He did not have to bleed great drops, sweat and blood, in infinite agony. And the Bible says he did it. You know why? He did it for the joy that was set before him. God in heaven is giving us an opportunity in the busyness of our lives to be still and know that the God of the universe values you like he values his own life. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, verse 16, can a mother forget her child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Ladies, you know that there's no love in this world, in this world greater than your love for your children. You have an inherent ability to nurture and love children that men do not have. It's a gift from God. But the Bible says, yes, she may even forget her own child. But God says, behold, I will never forget you. Your name is written upon the palms of my hands. When he died on the cross, your name was on his mind. It was love for you that compelled him to stay on the cross in agony as he bowed his head 
and died. God is speaking to us tonight. I believe the Spirit of God is here doing the work to draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps for some of us, it may be our last opportunity. We don't know. We're not promised tomorrow. We are promised today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And you find yourselves tonight, perhaps, looking for something that is peace, something that brings joy, something that the world you know cannot give. And now tonight you see by faith God hanging on the cross so that you can have what he deserves. And he gives the invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. He wants to be the savior of your life. All you have to do is bring him your sins. Let him have them. And he will give you the gift of his righteousness. All you have to do is believe in the promise of God. And God says it will be for you. It will be sure. Jesus is speaking to your hearts. I know there are people here tonight that want to make that decision. You want once and for all to have the peace that will pass all understanding. You want something that you can believe in. You want to come back to the arms of God. You want the salvation of the Lord in your life tonight. Jesus is waiting for you. There are some here tonight that you've known this, but the trials and the storms of life beat upon us and beat upon us, and we lose hold of our faith. Little by little, it doesn't happen overnight, it is a gradual, imperceptible process that we begin to, to slip and lose our hold on God, and we find ourselves back in the world. We have no love. That first love has gone. But God is always there knocking at the door of our hearts, right? He's always pleading with us to come back, to accept Him again. But yet you find yourself captivated with trials, domestic problems, stress, financial difficulties. You don't find any way out. You feel like that you're just captivated by the world, but now you want freedom. Jesus is the way out. Can you say amen? He has a million ways to work for you if you but trust in him. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you free and full right now, but he will not force you. He will not force himself on you. For he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? God is waiting. And I want to give you the invitation to make that decision tonight for Jesus Christ. He bled for you. He died a horrible death for your redemption. And he looks from heaven to see if we have the courage and the love and the faith to say, Lord, I appreciate what you've done for me. Here I stand in the sight of heaven and accept Jesus as my personal Savior or rededicate my life to him fully and completely. Don't think about your future. Jesus says don't think about tomorrow. Think about today. Today is the day of salvation. I want us all to stand tonight. Let's stand together as we sing that old familiar hymn, Amazing Grace. And we'll have three stanzas on the screen. And as we sing, this is what I want you to do. Listen carefully. I want you to make a decision for him. Jesus is watching from heaven. You can accept him as your savior. You can make a decision to, to surrender your life fully to him. I'm doing it tonight. I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I know in whom I believed, and I know that he lives today. As we sing this song, Amazing Grace, and you want to step out for the Lord Jesus tonight, I want to ask you to just come forward as we sing. You can come forward. We have plenty of room right here. I'm going to make my way down for you as we sing Amazing Grace.
travel the world, I meet many people, and I see the conviction. I know the Spirit of God is speaking to our hearts. There are many tonight that don't know it, join this evening, but they will go into Christless graves tomorrow. They will not be in the land of the living tomorrow. That's a fact. It happens. And I know that it takes courage. You're not stepping up for me tonight. You're doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your neighbor will not save you, but Jesus Christ will. Don't let the devil nail your feet to the ground. If you need to make a decision for him, he'll accept you. You can come forward and accept his amazing grace. As we sing our final stanza, let's sing like we mean it. And make your way forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? When we've been there 10,000 years, Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first believed. God is good, isn't he? Let us pray, shall we? Loving Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to come together to worship you and studying your word. We cannot fathom that grace, but we sure can accept it by faith. Jesus, the infinite creator, the God of heaven, came down to this world and gave his life for us. I thank you, Lord, for doing that work in my life. I thank you for everyone that's here and the work you've done in their lives. And I know I know there are people here tonight that are bowing their head to the ground and asking you to come into their heart. And I pray that, Lord, you will surround them with your presence, that you will strengthen them this very hour, because I know the enemy is not happy with their decision. But I pray that, Lord, you'll give them the peace and joy that your salvation brings. Bring us back together safely tomorrow evening as we study Revelation's mother of all battles is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.